I look at the book of Mark. Brother Ramsey was a mentor of mine, one of the great preachers in the 20th century. Passed away in 2006, and he was known as a walking Bible. And one of the things he suggested to us was to make one point from every chapter. Imagine if all of us knew one point from every chapter of the Bible. And we could speak intelligently about that particular point. And then maybe over time we added another point. Maybe a third over time as we study. And I do hope that you have a plan for 2021. How you will study the Bible. What will you do? I put on Facebook last night. I got up. I couldn't sleep. About 2 o'clock. And I, I wrote on there some things about spiritual. And I wonder why we are so content with just reading the Bible once per year. Why just once? If we truly believe these words were from the Creator, would we read them more? Would we read them more? Do you realize you can read the New Testament like every six weeks or so by just reading a few chapters a day? Just a few chapters a day. The equivalence of maybe watching a sitcom on TV, you can, you can read the New Testament like every six weeks or every two months. You can easily figure it out. Also, another thing I would suggest is don't do the Bible reading program where you read the Old Testament for the first 10 months, and then finally about November you get into the New Testament. Uh, try to read them together. I just finished teaching the book of Proverbs. I think there's a reason why there's 31 Proverbs. So maybe it'd be a good practice every day. We read some from the old, some from the new, at least one proverb, and I would encourage you to read some of the Psalms. Psalms is kind of like, you know how sometimes you stop at a gas station and you put some of that, you buy, you're you really motivated that day and you get some of that gas stuff you put in your gas tank? Because you're like, maybe this will help my, my car run just a little bit better. On the way up here, I got the, the highest gas rating twice. I don't know why. I just felt really motivated. I want my car to run just a little bit better. I don't know if it worked. I think adding Psalms to our life is like adding that little gas incentive. It encourages us, it builds us up, it reminds us who God is. So let me encourage you to add all that to your life in 2021. In Mark chapter 1, we learn this particular point. Jesus Christ is a man of prayer. Look at verse 35. In the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Brethren, we need to be men and women, boys and girls of prayer. We need to believe in prayer. You know, sometimes as you get older, maybe you can't do what you used to do. Maybe you can't go out and knock doors. Maybe you don't have that strength to go do, do this or that. But there's one thing that you can always do. If you're locked up at home, if you've got COVID, if you're at home and you're scared to go out, there's one thing you can always do. If you're in a nursing home, there's one thing you can always do. And that is there is power in prayer. Never forget that. There's power in prayer. In Luke 18, 1, Jesus said, we should always pray and not lose heart. Don't faint. And so I would encourage the church here is to pray like you've never prayed before. Isn't it interesting how we pray for the sick by name, but we rarely pray for the spiritually sick by name? I think that's something that we ought to change. We're not in the business of trying to humiliate anybody, but we believe in prayer. And we believe that God can work. And we believe that God can make things happen. Brother Mike Bessel used to say that almost every congregation could double in size if they could just restore the people who fall away. Just the people who are out there that used to come and used to be members, but they're out there somewhere. And my position has always been this. I would love for the Allison Church to grow, but more so than that, I want, Chris, I want people to become Christians and be faithful to God no matter where they land. We had uh, two people become Christians, and I actually contacted David Boswell I said, these two, these two people became Christians, but they live closer to where you're at. Let me encourage you, because I want them to grow. I don't, it's a 26-mile it's drive out here, and it's icy and snowy sometimes. I want to do everything I can to help people become Christians and be faithful to God and go to heaven one day. We believe in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. 1 John 4, 14 says, this is the confidence that we have. 
that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. I don't know about you, but I like to have confidence. You know, you, you, when, you, when you drive on these roads, you know, you, you've been here a long time. I've driven the snow. I lived in Michigan and Connecticut. I've driven the snow. But I was coming on the other side of Anchorage yesterday, and the car just started doing one of these things. And right where those cliffs over, where you go over into who knows where. And all of a sudden, just that one little 30 second episode, you lose your confidence. It's like, I thought I knew how to drive in this stuff. And then the Huawei stuff, and for about 15, 20 seconds, just going back and forth. And I thought I had it, and then went it again. Thank, thankfully, there was no car around us. You lose your confidence. But the Bible says this is the confidence that we have that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So let me ask you this. Is it the will of God that the church be faithful? Absolutely. Is it the will of God that the church grow and preach the word? Absolutely. Is it the will of God that we plant seed and God provides the increase? Absolutely. Is it the will of God that people will be more faithful and that we can restore the lost sheep who've fallen away? Absolutely. These things are all God's will. So when we pray, this is the confidence that we have. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, is it the will of God? Like I used to pray as a kid, God, would you pray, would you please make me really wealthy? Would you really, really make me so rich that I can't stand it? Well, as you can tell, that wasn't God's will in my life for sure. But God, even the Bible says, the love of money is the root of all evil, right? So, uh, what these are things that we know what God's will is, so let's pray those things and let God work. Isn't it interesting that Jesus was a man of prayer? Here's the one who said, let there be light. And he still, it says here, he rose up early before it was day and went to a solitary place and prayed. It would be wise for us to imitate the Lord. In Mark chapter 2, we learn that Jesus Christ is a man of logic. We shouldn't be afraid of logic in the church. We should make sure that what we teach and preach is lines up with the scriptures. And the Bible is a book of logic. Look at verse 16. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Jesus is a, he was a man of logic. It's interesting, the Bible is a book of logic. Think for a moment, in Mark 16, 15, 16, Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Notice what Jesus did there. He put believe and baptism precedes salvation. So before one could ever be saved or have salvation, there must be some believing and some baptism before salvation can ever take place. The same is true in Acts 22, 16. What are you waiting for? Or why tarriest thou? What did he say? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I know there that before one can call on the name of the Lord, or one has called on the name of the Lord, there must be some arising, there must be some being baptized, and there must be some washing away of sins before one can say they call on the name of the Lord. And so we see that in the Bible is a book of logic. All of these things work together. In chapter 3, we learn that Jesus Christ is a man of impartiality. And so must we be. We are impartial. Look at verse 31. His brothers and his mothers came and standing outside said to him, calling him, and a multitude was sitting around and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them saying, Who is my mother or my brother? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about and said, Here are my mother and my brother. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus Christ, a man of impartiality. One of the great things about being a preacher and being a part of the church and active in, in maybe some of the decisions that are made within a congregation is you see that all around the world, the church is growing. You'll never hear me say 
the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not growing. You never hear me say that. Because I know it's not true. I know it's not true. The church is growing all around the world. I know it's growing at Allison. I've heard over Northern Light, they're growing. They had three baptisms at Chan Small Tracks the other day. All around. Brother Ron Holbrook was at the Allison Church a few months ago. And he said this. He said, God always has a harvest. Now don't get discouraged. Because the harvest can be anywhere in the world. He mentioned, he said, you know, back in the 1800s and 1900s, there was a great harvest in America. A lot of congregations that exist today are part of that harvest. They were began then, and many of them continue. God always has a harvest. Every time I look at Facebook, I see scores of people being baptized in the Philippines. Scores of people obeying the gospel. We help a guy named Vietnam in India. I've helped him for several years. Not me personally so much as where I've been. And uh, a few weeks ago, a brother stopped by my house and he said, uh, he gave me $1,500. He said, I want you to send it to Vietnam. I said, okay, you sure you want to do this? He said, absolutely, I want to. He heard me talk about it. So we immediately sent that money to him. He and his team of preachers, they go out into a place called the forest. Out there, people don't have electricity. They don't have cell phones. They... All these modern things that we have, they don't have. I don't have running water, I guess. They go out there, about 17 preachers, they put these speakers on their chest, and they go around and they sing gospel sermons. Not sermons, they sing songs. It creates, people come out to see, and then they preach. It reminds me of the miracles in the New Testament. One of the purposes of miracles was to kind of create an atmosphere where the truth can be taught. And so they come out, people are interested in what's going on. Who are these people coming in and singing? And they hear the message. That's $1,500, which was seems like a lot of money. But when you're traveling over 400 miles and you're with 17 other preachers, they're sleeping on the ground or in someone's, uh, someone in the community has a room that they can stay in. There's cobras over there and tigers. And that $1,500, 122 people obeyed the gospel. Vietnamese goal in life is to baptize 500,000 people into Christ. 500,000 people. That's his goal. Our Lord is one of impartiality. In chapter 4, we see that Jesus Christ is a man of power. A man of power. Look at verse 35. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. And when he had left the multitude, they took him along in the boats as he was, and other little boats were also with him. Underline that phrase, other boats. If you ever saw the, the, the TV show, The In Search of the Lord's Way, back when Mike Klein was alive and did it, one time he had a sermon, it was called The Little Boats. There were other people out there that witnessed this occasion. If you read the other accounts, you don't see little boats. In this particular mark, it says the little boats. And they were also with it. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus Christ is a man of power. We sing the song, Master, the tempest is raging. You remember when the pandemic started? A lot of us were afraid. And I'm not demeaning the, the, the pandemic at all. I believe it's a serious thing and we ought to, we ought to take the necessary precautions. And in our building, you don't see so many masks as you do hand sanitizer. And, and uh, we could all probably do a little bit better job. But uh, I do think it's a serious thing and people are dying. Obed Rodriguez, a Hispanic preacher, 43 years of age. He uh, taught at the school of preaching and taught the Hispanic preachers who came up in Mexico and 
his videos were on his Facebook page and he had the mask on the oxygen and he, he every day he'd give like some type of little one minute little sermon and say, you know, I'm very sick. The doctors aren't sure what's going to happen. And uh, long story short, about a week or so later, he passed away. COVID is a real thing. And while his wife was preparing for the funeral, Victoria, she passed away about two weeks later. They left behind a 21-year-old daughter named Virginia, or Laura. She's, she remains. And uh, so we've been praying for her. Uh, Eddie Stiegel, a preacher of the gospel, he passed away um, a few weeks ago. Um, the, the preacher in Buller, Texas, I, I never knew him, but Raymond Moore is a friend of mine, and I saw on Facebook today, he said, I'm going to Buller to preach. Well, Buller lost their preacher to COVID. So COVID's a real thing. Something we ought, to be, we ought to take seriously. But in reality, the whole scope of everything is that Jesus Christ has great power. He has power over death. Today would have been my mom's 69th birthday. My mom passed away about a month and a half after we moved to Alaska. Last time I saw her was when we walked out of the door to go to the airport. Love my mom deeply. To you children that are listening to me, love your mom supremely. All of us, your mom still remains. Love her supremely. Call her as much as you can. And I suspect anybody that's lost their mom would, would agree with me on this. My mom was a faithful child of God. And I remember the day that they called me and let me know uh, she had collapsed on a Monday. And on Wednesday, uh, you know, I kind of knew about that. But on Wednesday, my sister called and said she's probably not going to make it. They did the brain test. It's not coming back very well at all. And I remember I, I went to the church building and I cried like a baby. I stood right in the pulpit area and I cried like a baby. No offense to babies. <laughs> and I remember we don't get visitors at the door, but some people came to the door. They were trying to sell something. And I came, my eyes were all red. And I looked like I was a mess, and they, I didn't know what they thought about me, but I used to go in there and uh, cry like a baby. But I've not cried since. Not cried since. Here's why. There's been moments I've wanted to cry, and almost every other day, I almost pick up the phone and call her. Mom, I, I love Moose. I got, I've seen 66. I keep track of them. I love Moose. And... Mom, I saw a, a move. Oh, Mom, I'm not here anymore. Mom always wanted to come to Alaska. I used to work for an insurance company, and the prize that year was you sell as much insurance, and you get two people get to go to Alaska on a cruise. Everything paid like twelve thousand dollars. I told my mom, I said, if I win, and I, I expected I would, uh, I'm going to take you with me. And she started buying clothes. Never came. My mom has seen something that far exceeds the beauty of Alaska. I believe. My mom was a faithful child of God. My mom loved the Lord. Lived her life with good works. I believe she's in that place that we all long to be in. Jesus Christ is a man of power. In chapter 5, we learn that Jesus Christ is our dearest friend. You remember the man that was chained down by the tombs. He's not properly clothed. And, and uh, I always think about this story, and I imagine all the parents must have said to their kids, do not go to that cemetery. Stay away from there. And you know some kids did. You know, they, you know mom and dad say, don't do this, and the kids kind of like, yeah, we're going to do that. Uh, and I love going to cemeteries. I don't know why. I just like the history. I like to read the tombstones. I like to go there and pray. And this particular man is a mess. And Jesus removes the demon, and as a result, he becomes his nearest, dearest friend. Look at verse 17. They began to plead with him to depart from the region, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed, he who had been demon-possessed, begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. You ever been in life before you felt like you didn't have any friends? I have. You ever had friends that let you down? People you thought you could count on? You know you got friends when your car breaks down. 
Remember that country song? You know who your friends are? You ever had a car break down? You didn't know who to call? It was probably because you didn't got no friends. Now, I've been in that spot. Here's one thing I do know is Jesus Christ is our nearest and dearest friend above all else. In Proverbs 18, 24, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I believe he's talking about Christ or referencing Christ. Jesus Christ is our friend. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ has done great and mighty things for us. And we must always remember that and always reflect upon the good that's been done, been, been done on our behalf. One day, because of Christ, our dearest friend, will live in heaven forevermore. In chapter 6, we learn that Jesus Christ is a man of peace. Look at verse 45, back on the Sea of Galilee. Did you know the city of Nazareth today is a Muslim city? There's a church of Christ in Nazareth. I've talked to the preacher there. And he lives not too far from the Sea of Galilee. And I always thought, what, what it must be like to preach in Israel. Not just to go there and preach, but to be the preacher there. And you just kind of pull back the, the curtains in the window and you say, you see that body of water out there? That's the body of water Jesus was on when he said, peace be still. That's the body of water that Jesus walked upon. And so you don't just talk about it somewhere in Alaska. But you're actually there. You pull back the window and there it is. In Mark chapter 6, we have Jesus Christ as a man of peace. He walks on the sea immediately. And that's one of the key words in Mark, immediately. He made his disciples get to the boat and go before him to the other side of Bethsaida while he sent the multitude away. And when he sent them, he departed to the mountain to pray. There he prayed again. And when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. Now get that picture in mind. The boat is in the middle of the sea. Now this isn't, a, this isn't a pond. This is a lake. The Sea of Galilee, if I remember correctly, is about eight miles long and four miles wide. So this boat is two miles out in the middle, Jesus' own land. And he saw them straining and rowing. Jesus got some good eyesight. He saw them rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and they cried out for they saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked to them and said to them, be of good cheer. It is I do not be afraid. And he went to the boat and the wind ceased and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marvel. Jesus Christ is a man of peace. In the last 18 months, my favorite aunt, Aunt Ruby, who's now 81, has lost two sons. They always said, as a parent, you want to die before your sons or kids do. Doesn't always work that way, especially if you live a long life. She's lost two sons. One went for a walk one morning, came home, and collapsed on the bed. Her and my other cousin, did CPR, did work, passed away. I did a funeral <coughs> out in the woods, a cemetery where we used to hunt deer. About three months later, the other cousin had a stroke, put in a nursing home at age 58. Horrible nursing home, they stole all his clothes. If it had a Nike or Adidas or something special on it, the people stole it. Probably the people that worked there. And long story short, he, uh, he passed away last May, May 8th. Almost every day I text my aunt. She texted me this morning. I'm surprised that my aunt 81 can text. She can't. She texts me, and how you doing? And I text her and I always remind her. I always try to give her some Bible passage that will encourage her to be faithful to God, to be steadfast, and to remember that God is a God of peace. And even before Christmas, I told her, and some people may not want to tell her this, but I told her, I said, I said, hey, Ruby, I know you are missing your sons because Christmas time is when family comes together. And you start seeing those little boys when they were little. You start seeing their images sitting in that chair, sitting over in that couch. And she lives in the same house she bought for $10,000 back in 1960. She still has the same phone number. It's the only phone number I know. If I ever go to jail, I'm going to call Aunt Ruby. 
She even got rid of it for a while and then said, hey, I want my phone number back. They still had it. They get back to her. Same phone number. Jesus Christ is a man of peace. I don't think my dad ever calculated what life would be like without my mom. She was a diabetic, and towards the end of her life, she was having to go and have the, the treatments done, the dialysis, about three times a week. And it was a pain. It was a pain. Go there, pay for her, pay for her belts. Take her there, take her back, take her there, take her back, wait for her, don't pick her up. I don't think my dad ever calculated what it would be like to not have mom. He's kind of an old Texas tough guy, almost 80. And I remind him that Jesus Christ, we have peace in him. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul called it the peace that passes all understanding. Paul was in prison. He was in prison for, he didn't do anything wrong, but he was in prison. That goes back to Acts. Back, remember back he went through all that two years in prison here and then he goes to Rome and the shipwreck and bit by the snake and he's in Rome and he's in prison under house arrest. Doesn't have his freedom. Probably sometimes he's saying, why God, why me? But he speaks about the peace that passes all understanding. So no matter what happens in this old world, we know we have a peace. A peace. And my time is up. But I want to remind you of Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. Look over there, please. I love the book of Romans. Someone once said, once you get Romans, Romans gets you. Romans is a book that will make you so glad to be a Christian. When I was a young boy, I became a Christian on July the 5th, 1979. In fact, John M. Davis baptized me into Christ. John M. Davis passed away on December 24th. Love that man. And, um, but as a young boy, I always felt like I was lost. You ever see that uh, video, uh, I think it's called a movie called The 300, and there's one scene where there's a big hole behind him, and they push him back into it, he's just kind of like leaning back, about to fall into it. That's how I felt as a Christian. I felt like I was always lost, until I grasped the book of Romans. Until I grasped the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore having been justified. Remember this, you've heard it before, justified. Just if I had never sinned. Justified. Therefore having been justified. So if you're a Christian, you stand before God right now, and you're trying to live for Him and do right and live right, you are just as if though you had never sinned. Therefore having been justified by faith. Notice what he says, we have peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace. The Greek word for peace is irene. It's where we get our old word that people used to name their little girls called Irene. Peaceful one. My mom's name, her original name is Iva. Another name that's not used very often anymore. I think my brother had a baby right after she passed away two months. and Her middle name is Iva. But Irene means peaceful one. So notice what he says here. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now the picture here is, remember how you go to Walmart during the summertime? And you buy one of those little kiddie pools that costs about $5. And you take it home and your kids get into it or your grandbabies or maybe at night when no one's looking, you get in it. The little tiny kiddie pool, five dollars. The image here is: imagine you get in that, and there's grace surrounding you. You notice what it says here. I'm not making this up. Romans five, verse two: Through whom all also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. In the Greek, there, that's in the present tense. It means as a child of God, we stand in grace, and we continue to stand in grace. This grace in which we stand. And rejoice. Notice in the Greek, the word rejoice and boast are the exact same word in the Greek. So you could put boast, in fact, in my Bible, I wrote boast next to that, in which we stand and boast, not in our own merits or works, we rejoice or boast in the hope of the glory of God. 
And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. Okay. So, when Jesus said, peace be still, that peace is what we long for. And as you get older, and you don't have the same strength you do, there's a magic line out there, I always say. There's a magic line out there for everybody, and you cross that line, and you start to realize, I'm getting older. You start to realize, you look in the mirror and say, I'm getting older. You grab a basketball and you start trying to play basketball and you're like, man, I'm getting older. Try to get on a bike, ride around, and like, man, I'm getting older. The peace that passes all understanding is going to help us and guide us in 2021. And so I encourage you with the things that I've said, I encourage you in 2021 to read the Bible like you've never read before. It's a good practice to take one point from every chapter. It can be your own point. You can make your own point up. And learn one point per chapter, per book of the Bible, and allow your faith to grow. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17, we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, and without faith it's impossible to please Him. So let me encourage you to build your faith up. Can I close with prayer? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the church here. We pray you'll bless this congregation now and into the future in 2021. We pray for those that may be sick or hurting for all those on the prayer list. Pray for those who may have COVID or who may be homebound because of the COVID going around. We pray that this congregation will do great things in the year ahead. We pray you'll bless us today, Father, as we continue our worship and as we meet together. We thank you so much for Christ and what he did for us. We pray that we'll do all we can to build our own faith up so that we can share it with others. We thank you, Father, for all the great men and women who've gone before us, who served you valiantly in this place and others. We pray you'll bless all the congregations throughout Alaska, Father, that each congregation will continue in your will, continue in your work, that you'll provide the increase in each place. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen.